more you read about narratives and language and story, you realise that um, actually it's a primary part of the puzzle of human evolution. Back in hunter-gatherer times, as Homo sapiens kind of became the only um, genus of the human species to survive, if you start to dig into why, it's because we harnessed language and used it as a tool that we use to shape how we live, and it defines the societies that we create. My name is Dakane Ayubi. Uh, I'm a writer and a restaurateur. I was born in Afghanistan. My family migrated to Australia in the mid-80s. And so my whole life I've kind of been attuned to this idea of who are the stories speaking for? You know, who is the media speaking for? What faces can I see in novels, in literature? And, you know, what are the stories that are defining our shared collective human kind of culture? Um, who, who's telling those stories and, and why is it so often that my face is missing or my voice is missing? I think how we tell stories is so important. You know, the stories we tell in Hollywood, the documentaries that we expose our young people to, or even the children's stories, the children's books, you know, all of that is input into the worldview of our young people. And so how do we do that at kind of a systemic level and give them a completely different narrative that they can choose? Are they going to be someone that contributes to a system of inequality or someone that challenges that system? The gender equality conversation has been had many times over many years. Positive progress has been made. However, there are still many issues arising from gender inequality across the workplace and in daily life. Around these conversation, there is a layer of gender fatigue. People are exhausted by having the same conversations, but only seeing slow rates of change. And there is defensiveness that arises from the gender divide style of conversations that pit men against women, that creates an us against them tension. There is no single solution to gender inequality. This problem is multi-layered and complex. But just because the conversations are difficult and potentially awkward doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to have them. Improving gender equality looks at improving the lives of everyone, women and men, because the reality is we are all suffering through gender inequality. As a direct result of our current gender norms, women experience sexual assault and domestic violence in unacceptably high numbers. And at the same time, our young men are committing suicide at alarmingly high rates. And across the workplace, a lack of female representation in senior management, on boards and in policy making positions limits our ability to have diversity of thinking and equal gender representation across positions of power. Our motivation for creating this documentary series is to investigate how we can improve our gender discussion to help move positive progress at a faster rate. To achieve this, we've interviewed a diverse range of men and women of different ages and from different cultural backgrounds to gain a collection of diverse viewpoints. Our advocates provide their first-hand insights on what's currently working to drive improvements. What are the challenges we face and ideas for how we transcend to new and improved gender narratives? Science is about ideas and ideas are not gendered. So if we can concentrate on the ideas and not the person, so there's you know, role models for the children, the wider their view of what a scientist is will become. The Little Bang Discovery Club, we've written a book to support the program, and in that book we made sure that we had boys and girls doing science. I don't see a difference in the genders of the kids, how they respond. It's more a difference in their personality. You've got rowdy girls and rowdy boys. You've got shy girls and shy boys. It's not whether they're boys or girls, it's more their personality that affects how they respond. 
there's so many factors involved in this that we see in media, um, in movies, in TV, we see so many of the scientists and mathematicians and data analysts and they're all male. And not only that is you're also seeing it from the parents and the teachers and their surrounding communities that there is that ongoing narrative, particularly in Australia, where it is quite stereotyped, where girls go into these types of careers and boys go into these types of careers. And I think those career decisions are being put into the children's minds at an extremely young age and we need to address that uh, discrimination right at the start. Looking at the construction industry as a way forward, particularly the younger females, they are interested in high views, they're interested in the hard hats, they're interested in you know what it is to be a very dynamic, active, creative industry and how you pull a lot of things together. Where we're seeing the disruptor now, which I think is really disappointing, is mum and dad. So they then go home, talk to mum and dad about this wonderful industry that they've been part of and that they've seen, and mum and dad turn around and say, you know, that's a misogynistic industry, that's very male dominant, you can't do that, you need to go off and study law, or medicine, or whatever, the, or something else that is not seen to be a, an older traditional male dominated industry. Well, girls in particular start to lose their confidence at age eight and it decreases exponentially until they reach about the age of 14 and then they're about 30% less confidence than boys. So why? Like, what is that? Is that stereotyping? Is it because I don't, I want to do what my friends do? Is it the parental influence? Is it puberty? It, you know, there are so many factors that contribute to this. It's important, I think, to be acting on all levels and to start to have different solutions and different outcomes now, whether it's, you know, how do you hire more women in male-dominated kind of um, workplaces. We need to start doing those kinds of things with seriousness. But I think it ties in, if we're talking about the sustainability and the depth of that kind of thing, then we need to perceive ourselves differently. And that begins by unpicking the disconnection that's kind of defining us. And I believe trapping our solutions today. I think everybody agrees to a certain degree that we want diversity in the workplace, but I don't think that we all agree on actually making a devil's choice but saying, okay, well, we're gonna de-preference men to preference women to balance the scales, right? Because to a certain degree, a lot of those men are innocent, right? Like they didn't construct, well, you'd say there's the patriarchy, but it's a whole other story entirely. But from my standpoint, um, all that does is actually create more of a conflict-based environment than a solution-based environment by trying to push your hand on one side of the scales to balance out a perceived injustice. Even me talking to you makes me fearful of having the conversation. Like that's how, that's how intolerant I think actually we've become in just having discourse on the topic. I think if we want to really change the narrative, we need to be able to have free and open discourse that is without repercussion so that people can actually be honest with their feelings and have a conversation about what they're really thinking than be fearful and say, well, if I speak about this, it's not in the party line and I may lose my job until we can have conversations that are much less accusatory <laughs> of men or women, um, then we can't really um, unpick and move towards the solutions we need. And I don't think it's any good to having half the population feeling persecuted. And I don't think that um, change, sustainable real change ever really comes from that kind of an attack. It's a really uncomfortable and um, a thing that's really strongly resisted to give up power. And I think the first step is acknowledging that that might happen. Men to some degree, or boys, have lost their way somewhat. Society has shifted so quickly from males being the breadwinners and going out and working and being the primary wage earner in really in a couple of generations. And they need to have a voice and they need to have a place in this because at the end of the day, this is about supporting everyone to be their best and, and work together. There's always this conversation around, it's, it's women in group, but the men are always welcome. And guess who never shows up? The men never show up. And I say, well, of course they're not gonna show up because what, what's in it for them? You know, it's the, the, the value proposition really isn't clear because the problem 
really isn't clear. It's about getting clarity about what's important to you and how you might make that clear to someone else. And I find that, believe it or not, most people are not clear. So that's the first bit about getting clear because it's not in clear in your head, then it's obviously not going to be clear in someone else's. And the second part is about getting your listener, your audience to care about what you're about to say. So how do you empathetically connect, but also then make it contextually relevant? So how you position an idea then becomes just important as what you're going to say. So rather than saying, men, you should get involved in this conversation. It's the right thing to do. I believe most men would think that it's the right thing to do. So it's really this idea of how do we make it practical and accessible for someone who already believes that they're doing the right thing and already believes that gender equality and the narrative of the conversation we're having right now is important, but can't necessarily see how they are accidentally contributing to the status quo. As a young girl who grew up in a set of often competing cultural expectations, what I had come to understand is there are really strong elements um, of both uh, supposedly different cultures which actually do the same thing to women, um, which is try to tell them what they can do with their bodies, um, whether that is to uncover more or to cover. And that's what I was really interested in. This perception, I suppose, in the Western narrative that the Eastern woman is subjugated and a part of this really like patriarchal society where she can't make decisions for herself. And then I also was exposed to women who would call themselves feminists in the Western world, who would actually impose all these kinds of conditions on women who chose to say for example wear a veil and you know telling them that they shouldn't be doing it because if they were doing it they weren't liberated and to be liberated they needed to take it off. I just think that when a woman is being told by anybody what she must do to be deemed acceptable uh, then that is a form of patriarchy and disconnection um, no matter where it's coming from or who it's coming from. I think one of the most dangerous things in a culture is when people don't think there's a problem. So when they take their own experience and project it onto everybody else. Theoretically, there might be this perception that women can do whatever they would like to do, and they can, but is the culture around them supporting that? Are the people around them supporting that? Do they understand that different people have different needs? We all have different defining moments which shape who we've become as a person. So until we can accept that we are each radically different, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, we're going to be kind of asking for sameness. And I think that that's actually what causes a lot of problems in society. We use this language in our line of work that boy psychology is I am center of the universe and man psychology is I'm a part of the universe. And we only need to look at who's running our respective countries or companies around the world to see what psychology they're stuck in. The crazy thing about school, particularly for young men, um, is the model to be a young man often, um, whether it's articulated expressively or not, is to be strong, to be tough, uh, to be athletically gifted, to show no emotion. And if you can live into those certain ideals, then generally your high school experience is pretty safe. Um, but what a lot of them don't realise is, is that there's certain pressures that they all feel like they need to live into. And I think the principle of, for us is we know there's so much more to you and you won't lose any of your masculinity by actually opening up and exploring more range in your identity as a young man. I think, yeah, it's a conversation we need to keep having, not just, wow, look at all our science teachers who are female or look at this. Well, let's look at the other side as well and start looking at you know, valuing what the stay-at-home dad's doing and seeing that it is something you can do because I don't think too many of our boys would see that as something that they would do. Stereotypes like Daddy Pig as sort of a, a hopeless buffoon that can't get anything right. Yes, it's funny in some ways, but it's harmful in lots of other ways because it, it sort of permits this belief that dads are hopeless. And, and that's harmful for everyone because if dads are seen in that way, they're less likely to step up and have confidence to step up in caring for their family. 
To see a man pushing a pram down the street a generation ago would be very, very rare, but now it's not rare. And we need more men doing it. We need more men to be at school pickups and for that not to be an odd thing. So we want a world, obviously, where women are equally involved and have the same opportunities professionally as men do. In order to be able to facilitate that, we need to free them from domestic duties. And to do that, having both parents equally involved at home is the fastest way to do it. I do enjoy mentoring young people and, and as well as that I particularly participated uh, as a mentor in the AICD female mentoring program which takes board ready women, connects them to ASX 100 directors and helps them really break into the male networks because one of the problems women face is they network differently to males. More than once I've had the conversation with women that go something like this. Do you know Rob Chapman? Well, our kids go to the same school. Uh, we've been to his house for dinner five times. Uh, we're in a lunch group together. Um, well, you don't think that's well enough to ring and have a cup of coffee? The reason I set up behind closed doors was because I didn't want other women going through what I went through in coming up through into senior management in banking. So there were no role models for me. There were no women in, there was one woman in Westpac in Sydney uh, that was in an executive role. That was it in banking. So I made a lot of mistakes because we didn't have coaches or mentors. We didn't have anything like behind closed doors. When Erin Phillips went down in the grand final, all of the women, even from the other team, high-fived her. Every single one of them. It was, it was awesome to watch. Now, why don't we do that? around our executive tables and, and in business and around our board tables is, if someone's doing really well, let's high five them. The most important thing for me is that AFL brings people together. Um, and it doesn't matter what background you're from, what gender you are, what you believe in, like everyone's celebrated. Female football is one of the fastest growing sports in Australia and it is just increased phenomenally. And it's just, Amazing to see how far we have come. We've gone from in SA alone in end of 2016, we had 16 girls teams here. Three months, four months after AFLW, it shot up to 67 female teams. It is, it's definitely been a challenge because there have been times when you're in a meeting and you may ask a question, a technical question, and instead of the male looking at you to provide the answer, he's looking at other males in the room. And so there is a thing for all organizations that are STEM focused, where you have to create an environment that's conducive for all people, all different types of backgrounds and gender diversity coming to the table. When you bring females in, you've got to create an environment that sustains them. Unless we can actually fundamentally shift we are going to be in a society which only values or predominantly values male qualities, whatever they are. But, you know, I, I suppose when you're talking about what we're seeing in politics, for example, right now with like these strong man leaders and, you know, I, I feel as though they're a symptom of the things that we have come to define as desirable. What we're talking about here is, is honouring and allowing and accepting human expression from any form, from anyone, wherever they are. I mean, really, that's the ideal, right? That's humanity 101. But right now, we're having difficulty honouring women who want to do a, a male-oriented job or honouring men who want to show emotion at work or stay home with the baby, heaven forbid. I mean, we're not there yet, but that's absolutely where we want to be. I don't think there's a, a single solution, actually. I, I really don't. I think if we were to come and at this problem, viewing it as something that we would see a, a, you know, a stroke of a pen, a legislative piece, we're talking about ingrained patterns of behaviour that we need to break down. And I mean, you look at the gender issue around same-sex marriage over the course of the last little while. It's taken us a long time to get there. But when the actual moment came, it was like, well, why was it ever an issue? I think that we'd be much stronger if our narratives took into account that sometimes we're jealous, sometimes we're egotistical, sometimes we're selfish, you know, I, and I think by acknowledging our limits, we can actually have much more truthful conversations around the kinds of societies we can build to facilitate and um, accommodate 
for all of those things. And if you've got this version of reality that pretends that suffering and flaws don't exist in the human experience, then we're not living a reality, we're living a fiction. So that's the kind of story that I really want to offer into our narrative, our shared collective human story again, because it's real and it's very important. And there's no time, I think now is the time that we need to remember and progress and not just progress, but thriving depends on the connections between us. And everything's about human connection. Storytelling in particular is about human connection. And if we've chosen or been ignorant enough to not connect, then we've, the opportunity's gone before we even start. Is it going to be pleasant? Who knows? Is it going to be um, short? Who knows? But the reality is that humanity's always prevailed. And I think that's where the opportunity really lies. Episode one sets the scene for our documentary series. We've introduced you to some of the advocates who will help us investigate how we navigate the challenge of creating new gender narratives to support new and improved gender norms. We've raised the importance of looking to acknowledge from all viewpoints, the weaknesses in our current stories in order to create a stronger collective human story, one that transcends male and female stereotypes and delivers us the capacity to support each other so that we all thrive. Join us in episode two, where we take a look at female representation on boards and in our most senior business leadership roles. We speak to a number of women and men who are working to increase the current underrepresentation of women in these roles and discuss why they believe it's so important that we do so. To stay connected and informed as we roll out this series, please like our Facebook page and you can re-watch any episodes either via our website or on the Channel 44 website.